The public has a long-held fascination with detectives. Detectives see a side of life the average person is never exposed to. In this podcast series, I Catch Killers with Gary Jubelin, I'll be interviewing a whole range of people you come across as a detective, including police, bad guys and victims. I spent 34 years as a cop. For 25 of those years, I was catching killers. That's what I did for a living. I was a homicide detective. I'm no longer just interviewing bad guys. Instead, I'm taking the public into the world in which I operated. The guests I selected have amazing stories from all sides of the law. The interviews are raw and honest, just like the world they inhabited. No one who steps into the world of crime comes out unchanged. Join me now while I take you into this world. This episode of I Catch Killers contains conversations that some listeners may find confronting or triggering. Discretion is advised. Welcome back to I Catch Killers for part two with our guest, Dr. Xanthia Mallet. We're going to talk about a couple of cases to get Anthea's opinion on where, why and how miscarriages of justice occur in our criminal justice system. But uh, before we do, we're going to talk about a few uh, cold cases or or ones in particular. And uh, one particular case that uh, has interested me just because it's unsolved and it's such a horrific crime. And uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. It's referred to in your book, Cold Cases, Mr. Cruel. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you just uh, tell us about the, uh, the crimes? Yeah, so this is a set of crimes. Um, we're not exactly sure how many perpetrated by a currently unidentified offender in Melbourne in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, the crimes that have been formally attributed to him are three children that were attacked, some were abducted, um, sexually assaulted, and there's also one potential murder. So that may be the fourth child in sequence, but there's question marks as to whether Carmen Chan was her name, um, was actually part of the Mr. Crawl sequence or not. So there are other crimes that happened earlier than that, um, but it's really difficult until he's identified to formally confirm which of the particular events are that one offender. And that's because he was very good at not leaving any evidence. And Mm. you've got to remember this is late 80s, early 90s, but he left no forensic evidence behind. He wore a balaclava. They were premeditated. He'd obviously targeted his victims uh, specifically. So he'd watched them. He went, broke into the homes. He took, you know, ties to tie up the parents. So he was very bold um, in his crimes. So yeah, and currently we still don't know who he is, but I'm I'm hopeful, you know, that one day we will still identify him. And a couple of uh, characteristics that came out from the crimes and, and part of uh, criminal investigation, the difficulty is trying to link crimes mm-hmm. sometimes uh, because of the um, nature of the crimes, but specific details. Now, with these crimes, and I, I don't know the sequence, of events, but uh, I think it was the first uh, crime that was attributed to Mr. Krill that he broke into a uh, house, um, tied the uh, tied the parents up, and uh, abducted uh, a young girl. Um, well, in the very first one, he didn't. Um, he abducted her for a short period of time. Yes, the parents were in, so that was you know a particularly bold crime. Right. And what's interesting about these and the he reasons he threatened them with a gun and a knife. Yeah, yep. and um, and he left forensic countermeasures, so pretended to um, be speaking to somebody on the phone, and he spent quite a lot of time there. You know, he was known to like eat things from the house and things, so he was yeah. very confident. You know, to break in where adults are present, you know, and and control them, um, and then abduct the child. And he didn't hold the first victim for very long, and he released her after a sexual assault, but in essence unharmed in terms of he didn't kill her. Mm. Um, But he'd taken her to a property somewhere probably around the flight path. So two of the victims were able to give details of hearing planes go over so they could narrow down an area as to where they had been held because they were blindfolded the whole time. He then broke into another house and abducted another child, held her for longer. And this pattern continued. So there were three victims that were abducted. And then the fourth victim was abducted. Her parents were out and she was murdered and found a year later. There was a couple of um, characteristics with the the crimes too, where he had the victims of the sexual assault uh, clean their teeth. Yes. And uh, would scrub them down and -hmm. and clean them to leave no um, physical evidence, one would assume. Uh, he also cut the uh, telephone uh, mm-hmm. lines. I think between the first offence and the second offence, it was something like 18 months or mm-hmm. it was a substantial period of time and then again and again. What does that tell you as a criminologist that when you're looking at someone that commits a, an offence of this nature? 
Well, he obviously there's premeditation, so he's stalked his victims. We know that two of them went to the same school. So we know that he was familiar with that area. He felt very comfortable there. Um, he would have known like the street access, etc. He would have spent some time watching these properties, so he would have been local. Um, and it also tells us, you know, that he he had the freedom and somewhere to take these children where he had time to spend with them alone. So he had another property. Um, but yeah, he obviously has a predilection for children. That doesn't mean he'll only offend against children, but he obviously has a sexual preference for children, females um, around 12, 13 years of age. So you can obviously tell a lot about him, about the, the, the targets of his victimization. Because it is, and it, what struck me about the, the case and that from well, I was going to say from a, a police point of view, but from anyone's point of view, the fact that uh, someone hasn't been uh, caught for crime, mm-hmm. crimes of this nature because they're, they're uh, horrific, um, and the boldness, um, and it's all to make a meal to break into someone's house to uh, tie up the parents, um, abduct the child, and also spend some time there. Um, I believe he also what we perhaps call in the police staging uh, like it was a robbery mm-hmm. to leave this is to give uh, police um, miscues I false suppose leads. Uh, yep. and false leads take you off on the r- wrong way but could also be in his own twisted mind that it was uh, oh, I'm not a sex offender I'm I'm a robber I'm mm-hmm. breaking in the houses like yep. I, I see some people that try and justify in their own minds oh, I didn't break in there to to rape the person I broke in there to just rob the house and presented themselves so. mm-hmm. but um to target someone like that I, and I, I see the investigation that was extensive as yes. as would yes. expected and in your book uh there's a like a geographical profile yes. of where you think the or, or where it's thought the offender might uh, might be living mm-hmm. because of the, the the proximity to where the victim's houses were what's your take on uh, geographical profiling i think it can be a really useful investigative tool so this is where geographic or perhaps more appropriately an environmental profiler because mm. they take the whole environment into account um, can look at say where somebody is abducted to where they were released to where the body was found and they will be around areas where that offender is comfortable so they will have like a residence or a place of work where that you know because criminals you know don't mm. tend to go somewhere random to commit a crime because it's too risky it's risky because they'll stand out um, exactly yeah. they want to know how to get there how to get away where the quiet roads are where access egress routes you know mm. where they're not going to get caught where the speed cameras are nowadays yep. you know yep. where they're going to get captured digitally so it's somebody who is comfortable in that area we actually call them comfort zones and they had another comfort zone near the airport so it's likely that they lived within a close proximity of where the victims were taken because it is quite a small triangular area mm. so they probably lived pretty much in the center of that area and then they had somewhere else where they had access to a property and privacy out near the airport to feel comfortable to keep uh, keep a victim that long and also there's a degree, I, I call it arrogance, it mightn't be the right way, but um, confidence to release the victim as well. Yes, yeah, uh, that they're the not going to get caught. Yeah, And, uh, and yeah, having the, the uh, thought process that they needed to uh, clean the victims and scrub the victims down. I'm not sure that's not some element of OCD, but I do think they were forensically aware and I think that's why they cut the phone line. They were trying to put the police off the scent, you know, yeah. was it a robbery, as you mentioned. So I think that there was a number of different things going on, but they certainly were enjoying the attention. Um, they were watching news with that's, the victims and commenting on on that. That that's interesting too, and I, I, I did pick it up in your book, but I'd forgotten about it. The fact that uh, one of the victims said that he was listening to the news yeah. clips when the the media were making the appeals. Yeah. So this is somebody who could be very forgettable in their daily life. You know, going yeah. about. You know, typical is the kind of average middle aged white guy living in the suburbs. Yeah. You know, everyone's neighbour they wave at, and so they're kind of forgettable. But you know, when they're in that other side of themselves you know they're enjoying they're reveling in the Mm. fear that they're causing and the impact on that community was huge you know people were really fearful about going out and leaving their children and he was breaking to homes with parents there so it was almost like nowhere was safe Mm. from this kind of monster because you know no one knew who he was he was he was the bogeyman yeah and i I dare say he would have been uh, the notoriety he would Mm -hmm. have been enjoying that he was reliving his uh his crimes through the fear and you know the parents especially of carmen chan and the other children who were abducted they were making public appeals Mm. and he was watching those and rather than you know 
feeding, you know, into his guilt or remorse and making him release the children. It was probably feeding the intense satisfaction that he was getting about the fact that he was, you know, the centre of that attention. And with the fourth one that was linked uh, by the investigators to uh, to that series of events, as you suggest, and I think it's inferred that, that there could be others that they just have not linked. The uh, the fourth victim in the sequence of event was uh, killed, mm-hmm. and uh, as you said, her body was found, and I think she was shot. Um, yeah, so I think it was difficult to determine her, the cause of death because right. she was fully skeletonised because yeah. it was about a year later, almost yeah. the day actually, a yeah. year later she was found at what is in essence a rubbish dump, you yeah. know, so no regard for respectful treatment of that victim. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you think that's, and people often, and I think this is a layman's view on it, that uh, the crime starts off small and it escalates or escalates. Mm-hmm. Do you think it, it was a case that he wasn't getting any satisfaction from the, the sexual assault then it escalated to murder or is it just a, a uh, circumstances where he's careful planning might have come unstuck? Yeah, I think it's difficult to say in his case. Um, I think possibly she was killed by accident, so she may have seen his face or, you know, possibly escaped, you know, mm. or seen something she shouldn't have done, identified the property, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I don't think an individual like this would have stopped short of murder if it was in their interest to do so. Yeah. So it may not have been their primary goal, but if she had potentially going to cause him any issues, he may well have killed her to prevent that from happening. Yeah. even if it wasn't his primary objective. When crimes of this nature stop, um, I, from a detective's point of view, and I know I worked on a um, uh, serial sex offender on the Central Coast, the Central Coast Rapist, and uh, we never found uh, found that person. His victims were uh, raped on um, in national parks and the age range was from uh, teenage girls to uh, elderly ladies. And uh, I think there was... Five offend or five offences that we uh, we linked this person to. Um, we saturated it with um, media and everything that we could do to uh, put the pressure on, and really made a point of saying, "Hey, we're up here looking uh, looking at this crime." But the crime stopped, and uh, we haven't to this day found uh, found the offender. And people have often said to me, "Well, what's happened to that person? Did he stop because you were looking for him?" I don't think so. I, I think um, whether he's moved into state, and we talk about that DNA database mm-hmm. because we had some uh, some forensic evidence left uh, left at the uh, scenes that we could uh, could trace him with uh, through DNA. But um, someone like that, in your experience as a criminologist and, and just looking at the patterns of behaviour, would you expect someone that just would randomly stop like because they found a conscience or well i don't think they stop because they found a conscience yeah. um sometimes we see crimes stop when there's some stability in that individual's personal life so right, so an environmental situation yeah. that they find it, might have found the relationship with someone that can control you. yeah or or just bring them some type of stability so ivan malat for example was known to go out and commit his murders when there was some sort of interpersonal breakdown in his right. relationships so he lost control in his personal life so he went out and committed his violent offense is because that's all about dominance, power and control. Right. So it could be that they found some stability or it may be that they don't have the opportunity. You know, yeah. their partner may work on shifts, shifts change, and they don't have that freedom anymore to be, yeah. you know, committing the same types of crimes. Um, I think it's unusual for somebody to just stop because they don't want to do it. Mm. anymore um we mostly say that they either stop because you know they move somewhere else yep they die or they're in prison yeah you yeah. know yeah so well, generally speaking I, I think from a police officer's point of view or a, a detective's point of view of investigating crimes of that nature I, I believe it's more along those cases sometimes when men get older they'll stop committing sexual crimes because right. as testosterone drops sex drive yep. drops they don't feel that kind of drive anymore yeah um and it's not unheard of so we've got um dennis radar on the in the states btk yep. he did stop and yep. then started taunting the police later and you know started up again so it's not unheard of right but it is unusual okay then uh, patterns occur with serial offenders and i i've always found it interesting and sometimes you, you miss the patterns and uh, what i've learned investigating serial offenders is that you've got to look out for the patterns and there was a uh, rapist uh, an investigation um a north shore rapist mm-hmm. who was referred to uh, he recently got out of um prison but we couldn't – there was a number of offences that were occurring around the North Shore um, where uh, ladies were um, out not in the early hours of the morning. It was, it was yeah, 
just when it got dark in the, in the evening, early hours of the evening, and uh, we've been sexually assaulted. And uh, the pattern was Tuesdays and Thursdays. And as it played out, that was when this particular person should have been at uh, tech. Mm-hmm. Had, uh, you know, so he had an excuse not to be home with mm-hmm. his wife and he was out and he wasn't going to um, night school. He was out um, stalking and, uh, and targeting people. And it was interesting in the behaviour because we had surveillance police out and uh, we observed him starting to stalk one of the surveillance mm-hmm. officers. So these are real premeditated uh, type of crime. Yep. And I think from a detective's point of view, and you must see it, I, I think, more in the study of criminology, where patterns do occur, that sometimes we look at um, investigations or offences in isolation but don't look at the bigger picture. Have you had any um, experience like that? Yeah, and certainly looking at those patterns, looking, and it's a lot of it is logic, you know. So he was doing that because that was when he had an excuse to be out. So mm. it's not necessarily just about a ritualistic behaviour, although that can come into it, but it can just be about, you know, the logic. You know, when they have access to vehicles, when they have access to spare time, you know, it's um, if they're travelling for work, you know, so it may be that it's actually matched in with their work patterns. Mm. So, yeah, the path, that's really important to start looking at, you know, what marries up, what logistically... Because because, you know, it's all based on um, logic and decision-making and low risk, balancing yeah. that risk-reward. Yeah, it, it's interesting when it is broken down that way. What about uh, stalking? Have you ever had any dealings with uh, stalking situations? I've only seen that when I've been looking at when they've, like, escalated. Yeah. So when crimes have started as stalking, um, stealing underwear, you know, yep. flashing, all that stuff, and then they, you know, build up to breaking entering sexual assaults, you know, as part of that. So Bradley Edwards in, you know, in WA at the moment started stealing yeah. women's underwear, you know, the voyeur elements and then you see that escalation to the sex crimes yeah but I've always found with uh, with stalkings or, or and also domestic where people breach AVOs and mm-hmm. all that from a detective's point of view that always gave me concern like when they've been told not to do something and, and that urge still overpowers them they know they're going to get into trouble for it and they still do it again um, that's always been something of concern for me is there a type of uh, a type of personality that uh, is likely to uh, to stalk. Oh, so I think the the controlling personality, so yep. the ones who get obsessive. Yep. Um, so then they may, you know, upgrade starting to bother somebody, calling somebody, turning up at their workplace, all of that. And I think those yeah. obsessive personalities are dangerous because if they can't have what they are focused on, that can then exacerbate a violent response or a rage response because they don't have control of their emotions. Yeah, that, that's what I. Uh, that's what I have always thought with uh, with stalking from a, uh, for an indicator for me as a uh, detective, uh, where there's been stalking involved, it always worries me. That yeah, it seems are... low level, but actually, it's where it can escalate to that's the problem. Yeah, well, low level crime quite often escalates, and uh, I quite often talk about the murder of uh, Barbara Saunders, who was a. Uh, Middle-aged lady had been uh, shopping in the city and uh, caught a train back, and I think this was 2001, at uh, Normanhurst Railway Station, and um, she was shot uh, during the robbery, gone wrong. That escalated from the the group of kids that committed that offence, and uh, the the actual offender that pulled the trigger wasn't a a, a juvenile, but uh, he was operating with other uh, uh, juveniles or, or juveniles. They broke into a school canteen and they broke in three or four times and didn't get caught and thought, mm-hmm. this is good. Mm-hmm. Then it escalated to breaking into houses, so they got away with that a bit. And they broke into a house and uh, found a gun that wasn't secured properly. And uh, now these idiots have got a gun in their hand. Yep. Then they decide to rob a bottle shop and they got away with that. And then they uh, they just... Uh, Barbara's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Empowered. Just, uh, and uh, Empowered, but it starts off... They got away with a little crime yep. and then, um, okay, there was no retribution there. So then it escalated and someone was killed. And from a police point of view, and uh, I know over in New York when uh, crime was out of control, and I think it was the 80s or the 90s with the broken window effect where... Get away uh, with it. Uh, uh, just don't let them get away yep. with minor crimes yep. and it reduces the major crimes. And, yep. uh because as a homicide detective, I'd often see the end result. Yes. And you look at it and you see a pattern. You see, like, you see it build. And I'm, I'm thinking. If we'd stop them then. Why didn't we nail them when they yeah. broke into the school canteen? Yeah. Because that wasn't going to be too hard to hard to solve. But uh, do you see a pattern with that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. That escalation, I'm very 
very aware of that. And I actually had my first personal experience with somebody flashing me on Easter Friday and I had my two dogs with me. I've got right. a Rottweiler and a Shepherd and it was on my dog walk. And it was Should like, have unleashed the dogs. Well, it was like quarter to seven in the morning and yeah. I was in an isolated area yeah. and I had never had that experience before. And I thought, what a weird thing to do at quarter to seven in the morning was yeah. my first thought. I didn't feel particularly threatened because I've got a Rottweiler and a Shepherd with me. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I wouldn't come over, mate, because, you know, it's not <laughs> going to go well you for you. You haven't got your Shih Tzu. Or- yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or my little Pomeranian, yeah, my yeah. chew on your ankle. So, but then I did report it because I'm fully aware of where that can escalate to. And it may start as a low level, but clearly that individual had waited. I didn't think it was personal. Yeah. They just waited for a female on their own. And I thought that can escalate into the next woman who walks past him. And I must have walked within maybe two metres of him from where he was standing. And I thought the next woman, he might, if she hasn't got a Rottweiler with her, she may be vulnerable to him. There was no one around. 100%. And that's where I I always encourage people because quite often I I get called from uh, friends or friends of a friend that, uh, yeah, what shall I do? This has happened. Yeah. Report it. Like police need to know about these yep. things, or they can't act on it. But you're quite right. Uh, the right, different type of circumstances. Yep. That was his thrill exposing himself, and it was threatening actually. And yeah. it was the eye contact. That was the threatening part. Yeah. Somebody engaging you in a sexual activity that you didn't want any part of. Yeah. yeah. And that's what got me. And I thought I may have felt different if I didn't have my dogs with yeah, me. Yeah. 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 And I didn't want any other woman to feel that. So I, I sh- probably should have gone over and go, let's explain this to the kids what you're doing and how this is socially unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. But I thought call the police instead. Yeah. Well, probably the sensible thing yeah. or just oh the dog's got off the leash yeah how did look, that happen go fetch yeah. <laughs> yeah um but yeah you, you're quite right and uh those type of things i i think from a policing point of view because i often think and i perhaps it comes from doing homicide because you see the end result yeah. so if you could make a change earlier on yeah. intervention before it gets to that that point yeah or time. you have friends where they're describing a new partner that's being controlling and you can see those low level controlling behaviors yeah and you just know like all those alarms are going off go if you don't stop this now this could escalate because you know yeah they're calling you all the time they want to know who you're with they're monitoring where you're going and you go whoa you know yeah. this is where this starts yeah the the um Domestic murders where there's um, yeah a hundred texts or, yes. or whatever. And, uh, yeah, and it seems caring to start. I just worry about you and all of that. It's yeah. actually they're being really Con- controlling. Controlling. Um, okay, we're going to get into a, an area that I know you're uh, passionate about, and uh, with your book um, Reasonable Doubt, and that's uh, wrongful convictions. And uh, it's interesting because you, your field of expertise is is skills and science that help police catch people. But then you've also got this other other side of you that um, you're passionate about, that uh, people that uh, where the justice system has got it wrong, and uh, certainly in your um, in your book at the start of the book, there's a quote there, the, the introduction that's from Benjamin Franklin. It's better a hundred guilty persons should escape than one innocent person should suffer. They're very powerful words, and I think it's a, a something that's held held very dearly by the justice uh, system, and it's quite often quoted, quoted at me as a police officer about uh, the fact. What's your views on that statement? I think that's right. You know, we all are held to account by the justice system, and we all need as civilians who sign up to that, you know, social accountability that it's they're going to get it right. If you know, we need to know that the right people are going to go to prison, and the right people are not going to be found guilty. Mm. And people always think it's a bit weird that sometimes I work with for the police, and sometimes I work, you know, and question the police. Or the justice system, whoever it may be, it may be experts within that. But I don't work for either side. I work. My interest is in the justice system overall. So, yeah. you know, whoever that's going to be to serve justice, I'll kind of tread either side of that line gently sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I think you have to have those checks and balances in place to make sure that you know generally we we have to know we're getting it right. It's a healthy approach, really. You, you, if you're going down one path, and people often think as police officers. We just want to see the bad guys put away. 100% I want to see the bad guys yeah, yeah. or bad women put away. But I would be mortified if I charged someone or had someone uh, punished for something they didn't do. And uh, I can only speak for myself that uh, if I if I am at the point where I'm charging, there's checks and balances that I, I put in place, like really question myself, like, okay, this is a case theory. What's the evidence? What's a pos- possible other hypothesis that could make mm-hmm. the uh, make this person uh, not guilty. Now, I'm not sitting here as almighty judge saying anyone I charge is, is guilty. I'm, I'm just saying that from a police point of view, there's a misconception that we don't, um, yeah, there's not a great deal of concern or care if you're charging someone. I charge, there's one person that I, I charge that I, I found out it was um, 
uh, he was innocent. And I'm not saying other people I've charged haven't, haven't been innocent. Certainly some of them have. But there was one person that uh, a crime was reported to me and I was um, I was a young detective at uh, Hornsby and I got called out in the early hours of the morning and uh, a girl had come in and complained that she'd been sexually assaulted. And I, I was called out and they had the suspect in the uh, in the interview room and I went and interviewed him on, on Urus and uh, put the allegations to him and he, he had made admissions. Now, these people were the type of, when I say kids, they were teenagers, late teenagers, 19, 20. And they'd been, they're the type that sat at home and watched videos the whole time and they didn't have much going for them in, in life. And this person I interviewed, he said, yeah, I shouldn't have done it and uh, it was wrong. She had provided a detailed statement of how she was sexually assaulted. With that, uh, he was charged. There was, I had no other no other option. He, he'd made uh, full full admissions, but there was something about it that was niggling. It, he just didn't seem, um, yeah, the type of person that would uh, take advantage of, of the girl. And uh, we took him across the court. Um, I tried to get him bail. I suggested that he should be allowed to get bail, but for I can't put people in jail when I try, and I can't get people out of jail when I'm try. Um, the magistrate ruled he's going to jail. He was, he was. I call him the red tracksuit man. He was wearing the red tracksuit, and I thought this is not going to go good. This this poor bloke, like he, he's a kid, and he's going to Parramatta jail dressed in the red tracksuit. And uh, from that, about a week later, the victim has contacted me and said. Oh, he's sending me letters from prison. So I go up up to uh, her place, and uh, with my partner, it was uh, Paul at the time, and we knock on the door and uh, go in. And uh, she said she's got a note from him that he sent from prison, and it's newspaper letters cut out. If you don't drop these charges, something like that. And I said to Paul, "Let's check the kitchen tidy bin." And sure enough, oh. there was a newspaper with the the letters cut out. So we take her back to the police station, charge her with public mischief or whatever the offence yeah, was. Wasting police time or yeah. whatever. Yeah, and then I did everything I could to get that bloke out of jail and couldn't get him out of jail. And uh, I report after report and the wheels of justice had started turning and you couldn't roll them back. It ended up going to trial out at Campbelltown. He was found not guilty. But while he was in jail, he got his jaw broken, uh, got assaulted in, in there. That, to me... Taught, taught me about the the power of the state once it starts rolling. It's such a um, big um, immovable object, and it's hard to work, um, pull it back. Yeah. So imagine if you're somebody who's been wrongfully convicted or wrongfully charged, you try and roll that back on your own. I mean, you're a police officer and you can do it. So yeah. imagine if you're just a civilian who's accused of a crime. Um, a lot of them will say they didn't do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and but the ones who haven't, you know, what? Where is the recourse in that? Yeah. And look, all, all jokes aside, I, I change my views and I'm more receptive to what you're saying after the experience I've been through and feeling the pressure, and I'm not going to even debate the guilt or innocence of uh, what uh, I've been convicted of, but feeling the pressure of the state on mm. you, and I'm someone that understands the system and someone that's been in the system, so well-placed to push back, fight back, it was overwhelming. So when uh, some of the examples in the book, and I want to talk about one particular case that um, Khaled Baker, mm -hmm. um, what, could you just give us an overview of that Sure. Case? So Khaled was a young guy who was at a, a party with some of his friends. Mm -hmm. He's um, African in ancestral origin. And that's relevant because there were basically it was a party for Caucasian individuals and there were an, just a few groups that, you know, Khaled and his friends who were of African descent. And they were at the party, then a fight started to kick off, there was some racial tension, there was drugs, there was alcohol, there's a lot of people. You know, it's kids at a party. Um, there was an altercation and one of Khalid's friends was having a kind of pushing fight with one of the, the white guys at the party who sadly fell through a window and fell about four metres to his death while he died shortly afterwards from head injuries. Now, both Khalid and his friend, who was only 17 at the time, so he's... Uh, his identity has been suppressed, um, were arrested and charged with murder when that individual died. Even though the friend said he was the one tussling with him, Cullen had nothing to do with it. There was no intent to kill this guy. It was just a horrible accident, you know, that happens when a lot of people are, you know, bustling yeah. around and there's too much alcohol and tension. But Khalid was found guilty of murder and his friend, who in the first interview with police said it was me, I was the one having that, that altercation, Khalid had nothing to do with it, he was found not guilty and Khalid went to prison. 
And so that was probably on the basis of some some of the Caucasian individuals gave witness statements that identified Khalid as the one fighting. And it was probably genuine statements, mm. but they just got them confused because yep. we're not very good at identifying strangers who are of a different ancestral origin to ourselves. We're not great at identifying strangers anyway. Mm. Eyewitnesses are notoriously bad at that. But when there's a racial effect too, it gets even harder for us to do that accurately. They just got it wrong. Yeah. That's and all. That, that racial effect, and I, I think break it down so we know exactly what we're saying here, that if um, Asian people are looking at white people, they might say a comment, they all look the same mm-hmm. or not be able to distinguish between and if uh, uh, across the different types of races. Mm-hmm. And I, I found that um, with uh, the Barrowville matter, with Aboriginals and uh, white people and uh, identifying Aboriginals and uh, the problem is that uh, they can't be relied upon. Now, for a case like that, like this is a, a serious charge. Mm-hmm. This is not um, not something to laugh about. Someone's lost their life. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got one person saying, well, I was the one fighting and then you've got witness identification, for want of a better word, saying, no, it wasn't him, it was them. Yep. How did it get so wrong, in, in your view? I think the I think the white witnesses at trial who said it was Khalid and not his friend were perhaps more believable, you know, more um, maybe presented their evidence in a more um, believable way to the jury, more acceptable mm. way. Some of the, the friends that were there, um, most of whom knew Khalid and, and the other guy, but one didn't. He was also African and he identified Khalid and the friend correctly and said, no, it wasn't him, it was the other guy. Yeah. But they just didn't believe them. So the jury were just, you know, convinced by the white witnesses over the African witnesses. So whether there was a racial element in that as well, um, it's it's possible. You mm. know, they just believed those who they thought was more reliable. And that's all the evidence they had. There was nothing else to go on. Now, what I understand with that uh, case, he spent, was it 13 years? Mm-hmm. And so he's never been acquitted. No, nope, not not yet. But he's working with the RMIT Innocence Initiative. Um, so obviously, he's, could you explain what that is? Sorry. Yeah. So this is a group down at the University of RMIT who works with the Bridge of Hope, which is a charity down there. Um, down and in uh, Victoria, in Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. And they look at potential carriage, miscarriages of justice, and when there has been a factual miscarriage. So here we've got one person saying. I was the one in that mm. in that altercation. Um, then they push for a case to be reviewed. Um, if appeals have you know are, are still open, they may look for legal assistance. But in this particular instance, they're looking for him to be acquitted of those charges because he's now out. You know, he's not in prison any longer, so you know he's free. But he's still a convicted murderer, mm. and this is going to affect him for the rest of his life. And he wants to be free of that particular. Um, you know, charge that he carries around. So, um, yeah, they're still fighting for him to be acquitted on those grounds, and that's an ongoing battle for him. But if anyone can do it, Khalid can. He's a very inspirational young man. He was a champion boxer. He kept up his training yeah. in prison, and he's come out and he's winning fights again, you oh, know? So yeah. if anyone is going to do it, it's going to be him. And he could have been really... I guess he could have found that a very dark experience, but actually he's come out, you know, really inspirational. He really kind of shares his story and talks about the positive things that he's taken from this. So if you want to look at somebody who's come out on the right side of this and is going to keep battling for justice, then Khalid is, is it, a story to look to. It, it's quite amazing that uh, someone can come through that. I, I can't even, com- I can't comprehend being in prison, but I can't comprehend being in prison where you feel it's unjust. Mm-hmm. And uh, For that long as a young man, you know, he was what, 20 it, years old? So, yeah, just stole you know, some of the best years of his life and he's come out with an attitude like that. He was it was on 60 Minutes? Yes. Was that uh, yes. there? Because I, I saw it and I remember thinking how impressive he was. He was, yeah. De- dealing with it. But how how does the system fail? In that case, I just think that, you know, the prosecution were determined to get one conviction. So the trials were held simultaneously. Yeah. And they cherry picked what they used from the unidentified individual in terms of his confession. And they said that certain parts could be relied on, certain parts couldn't. They wouldn't allow the jury to accept the part that he said it was him. Mm. Um, and it and Cully wasn't allowed to use that in his defence. So they basically had it always round. They were just, you know, playing, hedging their bets. You know, they got two guys, the jury might go for one of them. We don't really care which one you prosecute for this. Mm. And there was never a murder to prosecute for in the first place. It was just a yeah. horrible accident. Nobody even saw this guy get pushed. He may have literally just fallen through the window. And while that's tragic... A young man has lost 13 years of his life and he was actually nowhere near him. 
Yeah, and then coming back to that quote, the better 100 guilty persons should escape than one innocent person mm. should suffer. If we've got a justice system, it has to represent that, doesn't it? It it's, does, uh, yeah, but sometimes we get it very wrong. My, my frustration with the legal system, and I, I, I don't want to get on my soapbox about <laughs> it for obvious reasons. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Stop laughing. I'm being serious. Um I don't like it when uh, matters, and we'll take my matter out. I know it's pretty, <laughs> you know, pretty insignificant. But um, where smart legal barristers or whatever, like legal manoeuvrings, it, yep. it should not be about that, should no. it? And and that's where you know, if you get a witness in there that you can bamboozle, and a barrister can walk out proud of themselves that they oh, carve that witness up. But that's not really what it's about. It, it shouldn't should be, be about a, winning. It's about no. justice. Yeah. But yeah. some people see it as a game. They win at all costs. You know, you've got barristers that get the unwinnable cases because yes. their egos, and they go back to the psychopathic personalities, they just want to win at all costs because it's about it's about them. It's not about the case. It's not about the right person going to prison. Yeah. Uh, you've identified in the, in the book that uh, a couple of um, key areas – or themes that are common in miscarriages of justice. And I'll just go through it and then we'll talk about them. People who are disadvantaged, socioeconomic, cultural barriers or mental health, mm -hmm. problems with expert evidence, misinterpreting evidence or overstating the evidence, and then police tunnel vision, a fail to consider other evidence. So just breaking it down, first of all, where you talk about miscarriage of justice with socioeconomic and cultural barriers. What's an example of that? Well, no, I suppose you've just given it with uh, the one you've spoken about. But yeah, what's your sure. What's your experience there? Well, I think people who don't have resources. So, you know, if two people are, you know, charged with, you know, speeding offences, for example, and one is extremely wealthy, they're going to get a good lawyer that's going to get them off. You know, they might get a fine, they probably won't. Somebody who don't has that support, those resources, is probably going to get a different outcome. So you think the justice system is fair and balanced and everyone is treated the mm. same. And it's obviously not true. You know, when people are convicted or charged with serious crimes, you know, if they have the knowledge of the legal system, you know, that's obviously going to be helpful or at least the ability to pay for somebody who does. They're going to be seriously advantaged against somebody who is from low SES, low educational status. They may have, um, they may be from an immigrant background. So language may even be a problem. They may not even speak, you know, English may not be their first language and the legal language is is meant to kind of bamboozle everybody outside of that circle, yeah. isn't it? It's not yeah. straightforward. So I think if you pile on these different disadvantages, it can be really difficult for people to get a fair outcome. And I, I suppose we try to offset that with um, public funded public defenders and uh, legal services and, and that, but it's not the same, is it? No, it's not, it's it's, not the same. And and the amount of money once I, I I always feel sorry for people if I if I've come across them in the course of my duties as a police officer and the, sometimes they're the victims sometimes they're the suspects or the offenders or whatever and they're going to engage uh, a legal person and the money just disappears. Yep. You know, you can spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands on these cases. Yeah. And ultimately the Crown in a serious high profile case is mm. going to use all of the experts and resources at you know their disposal, which are very significant yeah. compared to somebody who may have a legal aid lawyer. Yeah. You know, they can't get all of those expert opinions to counter what the Crown can offer. You know, they haven't got the time to put into it. They may have a hundred clients they're mm. trying to work for. So the system is is so disadvantageous. And it's I, I, there's a lot of legal systems across the world, and I, I think ours is recognised as being yeah as, as good as you get. Mm -hmm. there, there's obviously improvements there, but there does seem to be a, a rule for one and a rule for others. And on the flip side too, um, I reference the Barrival matter. They were disadvantaged in the legal system because they were at first there was racism involved in it. They were Aboriginal victims that people didn't identify identify with, um, but also socioeconomic. So it wasn't just from an offending point of view. It was also from a victim's point of view, you can be disadvantaged in a, a justice system. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's the case of Kelvin Condren, who was um, found guilty of murdering his girlfriend, Patricia. So, And I think that was an issue there. So they were both mm -hmm. Aboriginal people you know, the police had Kelvin in their sights and they, they followed that track. The tunnel vision was yep. one of the things you mentioned. 
And, you know, there was no real interest in Patricia either because yeah. she was Aboriginal. There were no news stories around that. They didn't really canvas for witnesses. Nobody cared. Yeah. And I like to think that we've moved forward from that. But, yeah, you certainly see the racism in effect from the offender and the victim perspective. Mm. Um, the expert evidence. And do you want to explain what an expert uh, witness is in, in court? Yeah, so an expert witness is somebody who's employed to give an opinion based on some type of evidence. So that could be fingerprints, could be DNA, it could be image based evidence nowadays, um, all sorts of things. You could have somebody who um, looks at engineering, a bridge collapse. They yep. would be, you know, give you a forensic engineering report. Yep. And the forensic just means used in court, basically. Yep. So an expert, unlike a lay witness, is allowed to give an opinion based on their training, their exp expertise or their education. And they are there to help explain something to the court that is outside of the general knowledge of the jury. So something um, something special so that the jury needs to understand. And they're there to really explain it in layman's terms. Mm. So the jury can get, grasp how important that is, how much weight that evidence should be attributed in that particular circumstance. So with um, and they the jury get um, uh, uh, warns not the right word, but they get explained that this is an expert, and so you can rely on what this person says most of the time. If, well, the point I was going to make: I go to murder trials, and there, there'll be a pathologist, and then there'll be some other pathologist <laughs> that turns up as a defence every time there's a murder trial, and the um, the uh, pathologists that police have engaged will be saying one thing and then the pathologists will come in and, and interpret the wounds differently or mm -hmm. or that I, I can see the the need for it there has to be this um discussion and and uh determination of where the truth lies but i felt like within the court system some people were renowned to come in that was a, a, a expert for hire by the defense and that's certainly the case. So if you have given expert witness evidence in a certain type of case, then you may well be called upon to give expert evidence again in a similar case. And experts can feel pressure um, when they're being employed by prosecution or defence to give an opinion that is weighted to that side. Yeah. And I've done a few of these with the police and they often want to give you extra information. So if that's an alleged child sex abuse case, they may want to tell you about tendency evidence or did they have access to their victim yeah. or how many other charges? in? And I'd go, you know what, I don't care. I'm yep. just going to compare the images you have of the suspect to the images from the computer. Nothing else is of relevance to me and either they're going to be similar or they're going to be dissimilar and it doesn't matter about any of the rest of it. That's not my job. Yeah, well, that that's good that you take that uh, line because I, I know some uh, trials have come unstuck because uh, there's been criticism of uh, what information the police passed on to the expert witness and you know, were they independent or yep. were they looking objectively or were they provided more evidence that they needed or more information outside their area of expertise. And uh, I think it's something that we've got to be very careful of, or when I say we, police have got to be very careful of not to contaminate the expert witness by providing them information that's not relevant to their area of expertise. But then the expert has to also remember that we work for the court. We don't, regardless of who, you know, you're sending your bill to at the end of the day, prosecution, defence, doesn't matter. Yes. You're working for the court. Your job is to provide evidence to help the court mm. make a decision based on all of the evidence and yours is just a little teeny weeny piece of that. Mm. So, you know, it really doesn't matter who you write the report for. It's going to say the same thing. Yeah. And you have to keep that in mind. Well, that's that's the ideal world. That should yeah. be. But if you're getting paid by, say, defence and, um, yeah, you're identified and uh, you clearly the defence are going to engage you if you're going to be, say, saying something that's supporting them. And I'm not casting aspersions. I'm just saying that it does that's, happen. that's the reality of the reality of the world. Speaking of casting aspersions, police tunnel vision. Yeah, well, that happens yeah. too. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm happy to uh, talk about it. I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on it. Yeah, and we touch on that in some of the, the miscarriages of justice in the book where police have basically decided that they have their suspect yep. and they basically include all information in their case that supports that hypothesis yep. and exclude anything that is exculpatory. So anything yeah. that doesn't support their line of thinking. Yeah. And that can be conscious or subconscious, you yes. know, but when it comes to conscious, it can be, you know, going far enough that they're actually planting evidence yep. to get a conviction. Mm. Um, and that can obviously lead to miscarriages of justice when the police refuse to consider another suspect. There's uh, it, certainly, it is something that uh, has to be uh, considered and being a police officer and working on the cases I've, I've worked on, I can see how that can uh, uh, 
damage the investigation. I've always said, and I've, I've worried that it gets misinterpreted, when I'm looking at a suspect, if I'm, in, I'm investigating a crime, let's say I've got 10 suspects, I look at suspect number one, I'll look at that person with tunnel vision, and I've got to finish this sentence before you judge me or jump on me, I'd say, go at that person with tunnel vision, let's see if we can gather evidence that proves that person's done it, but also let's go hard and find if there's exculpatory mm-hmm. evidence that eliminates a person because I th- sometimes think sloppy police work is done because it hasn't they haven't investigated enough to potentially exclude get that exculpatory evidence i think we've um, and you get that group think situation and you get the pressures associated with a high profile mm-hmm. case and everyone wants a result and everyone will feel feel good i think the um, there's mechanisms in place to prevent that. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but to prevent that. And that's um, disclosure mm-hmm. that uh, where, and I'm, I'm just thinking back to my early days in um, detectives, it wasn't as formalised what you had to disclose to the defence. Now we've got to do full disclosure. So anything that you've gathered, whether it's inculpatory, exculpatory, mm-hmm. has to be presented to the defence. So your whole brief of evidence. Do you think that? Genuinely happens all of the time, though. I, I would, I would like to think. My eyebrow but, is rising yeah, slightly. I know. <laughs> Lucky it's a podcast. Oh no, yeah, we've got I cameras. Know. We're in trouble. <laughs> um, no, look, I, I, I think mistakes have made, made. Whether it's deliberate, you said unconscious. Whether it's just sheer weight of evidence that they, they've moved on and they forget to uh, provide that. Um, I know it's had uh, some very damning uh, impact on on different investigations. Have you got one where stuff hasn't been disclosed that should? Oh, have been? I've worked on cases where I've given reports that I know have not been passed to the defence because okay. it didn't support the case. They're not my cases. They're not your okay, cases, and that's not even it. in Australia. <laughs> no. no, that was in the UK, no. but I knew that that, that it wasn't going to be supportive of their their suspect and yeah they i know that it was look we we make light of it but that is corruption at its highest level if you if you're withholding information i i'm i'm joking uh, uh, i'm joking when i'm laughing about the seriousness of it there is no excuse for it and as a police officer you uh, you can't do it nor should you do it so can you give us the example have you got a, a, like the specific on uh, what was withheld or oh so that was oh i can't remember what time that was yep. probably an alleged child sexual abuse case yep. mm-hmm. um and i will always when i start looking Looking at a case, I will look for it, for features that will exclude that inf- individual from being one in the same person. Because that, to me, if you cannot exclude them, you will then look at features of similarity. And so you have to come up with a way of whether it's likely to be the same person. But right. you can never say it definitely is. But if you cannot exclude them, that can be important. So, yeah, it would have been an alleged child sexual abuse case. So, R- right. you know, a pretty serious matter. But I, in the book, there are definitely cases um, where exculpatory evidence was not passed on and to the defence. There's uh, historical overseas cases, Birmingham 6. Is yes. That, that oh, one? that was a mess, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that, that was where evidence was with, withheld. And, uh, yep. and I, I think it becomes, and this is me looking at it from a police point of view, I think it becomes uh, if an investigation gets loose or sloppy or whatever, that's where mistakes are made and then, um, yeah, things weren't uh, weren't disclosed. Barrival is another classic example of, uh, and this is not, this is flipping this, this is evidence that wasn't followed up that should have been followed up that wasn't followed up and that's referred to as the Norco Corner evidence that, I look at it now and I think it's strong circumstantial evidence pointing um, a finger at a, a certain person being involved in the, the murder of uh, Clinton Speedy. Um, it was reported to police but wasn't followed up. Mm. So there, there's a mistake in reverse. So yep. when I'm talking about sloppiness of investigations, I think it, it comes across. But look, I'm not going to sit here and say police have never withheld evidence. Um, I, I, I think that uh, it, it's done and it's been shown to have been done and uh, it's something that I'd like to think is stamped out now with the safeguards that we've got in place. But I hope not. so, but I, I do know of instances where the police have not even um, told the prosecution, their own like lawyers, about some of the evidence. So they are not, you know, obviously the, the prosecution can't disclose to the defence then because they don't even know about yeah. what the police have gathered. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I, I don't think anyone can argue argue against what, you, what you're saying and the importance of it and no one can really justify it if evidence is not done. Uh, not disclosed um there's can be a travesty of justice because sure. one innocent person may go to prison but then if a violent crime has taken place the, the violent criminal is still out there and there are circumstances again in the book where you know individuals have gone on to kill other people because the police failed to do their job they failed to collect the evidence and process that and the wrong person went to prison and the the guilty person went on to kill again 
that that's a that's a very very good point. Like it's all right if um, if police wanted to give themselves a pat on the back and say they've uh, put someone away, but uh, if they put the wrong person away, the offender's still out there. Mm-hmm. So uh, no one can uh, justify that. Um, another case that you talk of, and uh, I read an extract from your book because I think it's interesting. I want to get into your mindset on this, and it's a Kathleen Folby. Mm-hmm. Um, matter. Now, she's been, as I understand it, convicted of uh, murdering four children. Murdering three and a manslaughter of the fourth. Okay. And that's where it stands at present? Currently, yes. Okay. Um, you've uh, said, and this is an extract from your book, that uh, I'm campaigning for Kathleen Folby, not necessarily because I believe in her innocence, but I believe there is a justice process that has failed in this mm-hmm. case. I think that's very interesting. And uh, can we talk about it? Sure. Yep. And people always want to know whether I think Kathleen Forbig is guilty or innocent. And I always say it's just not the point. You know, yeah. my personal opinion is totally irrelevant. Is there innocent to prove that she murdered three of those children and manslaughter of the fourth beyond a reasonable doubt? And that's my position on it. So it really doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Beyond reasonable doubt is our legal standard in criminal investigations. And in my opinion, there are question marks over the death of those children, that there are potentially natural natural causes that could explain those deaths. Certainly all of the children had health conditions before they died. And there was never any evidence that she'd committed any harm to those children. They didn't show any injuries. Nobody ever saw her injure them. And the the thought that four children within a family, you know, what's the likelihood of that happening? Well, we've got historical records to demonstrate that Once you lose one child to sudden infant death, you can actually be predisposed for environmental, genetic, et cetera, reasons Mm. to lose more children. So it's certainly not a one-off event that it was kind of painted as. In families similar to the demographics of the four bigs, multiple children have died. And so that's where I come at it from, my personal opinion, irrelevant. I am concerned that the children died of natural deaths and somebody is in prison who is wrongfully convicted. Okay, because uh, it is, is interesting because, I, and I'm not saying these are not my views, but people would be saying, well, if you think she's done it, she should rot in jail. Um, that that might be the, the pub talk or, mm-hmm. or whatever I would imagine there. But it is an interesting take and I, I, I find it fascinating that you're saying, okay, well, you know, I don't know whether she's innocent or not, but the, the process has broken down the yes. justice system has uh, potentially yeah, yeah. yeah because she was convicted yet yeah, there were always question marks of whether there was some sort of genetic inherited reason why those children died and as recently as august this year mm. um some geneticists have analyzed the dna and two of the female children that died they've come back with mutations in one of their genes that could have contributed to their death mm. now those scientists you know have no reason to have an opinion on this they've purely looked at the dna sequences and found and isolated this mutation And they're going to look at the two boys to see whether they were genetically predisposed to health conditions that could have contributed to death. But currently, as things stand, we have new evidence that the children were vulnerable and may well have died of natural causes. It's uh, it's, it's such a serious topic, isn't it? And it's such a so much uh, carries for it because it's horrendous crime if it's happened, and but it's a travesty of justice if uh, uh, she hasn't. committed the crime for mm-hmm. which she's she's been convicted on um what got you into this is it what got you into the the yeah reasonable doubt type situation and uh well, when I was doing my PhD, um, part of it was the scientific element of the forensics. Mm-hmm. Part of it was looking at statistics, and everyone's going to yawn. But yeah, I had to look at a lot of statistics. We had three thousand volunteers no that we landmarked twice. No so. one can make statistics sound exciting. Oh, I give me some time, Gary. I can make <laughs> statistics. They are your friends. They answer <laughs> yeah. lots of questions. Um, but part of it was also looking at expert evidence and when that went wrong. And I looked at a particular individual called Professor Sir Roy Meadows, who was a paediatrician, and he was one of those experts who gave evidence in a lot of child death cases of mothers accused of murdering their children. And he came up with the maxim that one child death is sad, two is suspicious, but three is murder unless proven otherwise. And there's no statistical foundation for that. Um, And he gave evidence in a number of cases where women were successfully convicted of murdering their children or multiple children that were later overturned on the basis that the children had died of sudden infant death syndrome. Yet when I got to Australia and I saw Lindy Chamberlain's case and then I saw Kathleen Forbick's case, um, the same maxim was being used, you know, in the early discussions around Kathleen Forbick. And I was like, I've just moved all the way around the world. 
that has been totally discredited in the UK. He was actually struck off from the general me- by the General Medical Council um, as you know being an expert. And we were still relying on. We the were still using it, and I'm yeah. like, wow, we have got the same problems that we had in the UK, and the same erroneous facts are being spouted in these cases. And so since then, I think the book has actually been kind of embryonic since then, yeah. since I first got here and saw Kathleen Folvig's case. And I was like, you know, we've got the same problems. Yeah. And I think getting them out there and talking about them is the only way we can really start to unpick them and reduce the occurrence. So I think this book's kind of been milling away in the background since, you know, 2012. Yeah. I know I understand where you're coming from with that then. And uh, if you've come across and then seen the same thing happening here, it must have confronted you yeah and you're seeing the same patterns of disadvantage experts getting it wrong or just you know stating evidence outside of their remit or giving it the wrong weight you know Mm. so the jury can't really understand you know how they should interpret that evidence um yeah so seeing the same things here and i was like you know this is something we really should be talking about and obviously i had to include lawyer x as well because watching that situation unfold in victoria was like this is like something out of a film. Like, how can this have happened? Yeah. And the miscarriages of justice that that will lead to, you know, astronomical. That's going to rock the criminal justice system for yeah. decades. I, I don't know where that's going to uh, go in the In criminal convictions, I'm suspecting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I, I don't know enough about it, but watching from the outside, I'm thinking. It's crazy. Mm, it, it totally is, crazy. It's crazy. Look, I, I think it's good that you, you're questioning the uh, justice system and and like people think as a police officer or ex police officer I've got this one one view on on justice. I think we've got to look at improving the justice system um, wherever we can. And if it if it's if it's not broken, don't fix it. But if there's failings in the justice system or the way we investigate crimes, we've got to move with the times. Yeah, I mean I've got skin in this game too. I work with the justice system and within it. Yeah. But I can also step back out of it. So yeah. I kind of cross that boundary. But hopefully together we can all improve it to everyone's benefit. So if you or I are ever charged with a crime, hopefully the system will work well. You had to bring up. The I know. Crime. I'm sorry. I looked at you then. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I should not have said that. <laughs> you had to bring up the crime. Sorry. I'm dealing with it. Let's move on. Moving on. Move on. <laughs> um, okay. We'll lighten the mood a little bit because it were the not because of my charges. predicament. Predicament. Okay, that's a nice. I might put it that way. Predicament. Um, writing three books. Where do you get the time? You know, I. I do, yeah, sleep sometimes, um, but I just love doing it, actually. And a lot of the cases I've worked on personally, so I can actually churn them out. I'm a very quick typer, very right. quick. Yeah. Um, but I actually really enjoy it, and I'm pretty intense about it when I get going. I have very strict targets for word counts, daily, weekly, da da, da. Yeah. And I'm a bit of a machine, but right. I really enjoy it. So. Right. Have you got any others in uh, in mind or anything else? I that have you're got at? another one in mind, but if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Okay. So well, that's that's for another yeah. day. <laughs> okay. Well, we won't uh, won't raise that. Is there any um, with the work that you've done? Is there anything that sticks out in your mind that was just so bizarre, or or things that you've uncovered, or or things that you just didn't realise? Yeah, we, we're talking about uh, true crime, and you're seeing the extremes of yeah. human nature. Is there any one thing that? Well, I've met a few violent psychopaths now, and I think the most interesting thing about them is when you, you know when you push their buttons. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you can just get them to drop their guard, you know the way they don't want to. They yeah. don't want to let you see what's beneath because they almost wear a mask. Yes. And if you can push the buttons and you get to see what's beneath, and that moment of frustration when they know that you've seen them, yeah. and you go. There it is. And you got them. Yeah, and That's you got them got, right got there. Moment. So having seen that a number of times, and I think that disempowers them because they're always looking for the prey element mm-hmm. and it's like, gotcha. And I find that pretty, is yeah, that really no, sad I, to admit. I find that satisfying. No, I, was no, like, I, I can understand that. And how are you finding your, your lecturing up at uh, Newcastle University and the type of students that enrol in criminology? What's what's their interest in the field? Well, most of them are female. Like, yeah. I didn't even notice that until somebody pointed that out to me the other day. Um, but I'm really passionate about engaging them with the actual justice system and when things go wrong. So we've mm. just established an innocence initiative at Newcastle University. Yeah. And we'll look at cold cases as well. And I may be picking your brains at some point. Yeah. 
And part of that is to make sure a lot of them want to work in the police or um, juvenile justice, community corrections or with victims charities. And I want them to have a sense that what they're learning isn't just book knowledge. It's real people, real lives. And they need to understand the implications of the decisions they'll be making so that when they go into the world, they've got a sense of social justice and they want to do things the right way and actually help people. So that's something we're really passionate about. And hopefully our graduates will come out with that sense and go out into the workplace and, and and do good. We do want practitioners within the justice system that understand the humanity behind it. I think that's where it gets lost. If there's yep. failings, that's where people don't put the humanity into what we're actually doing, whether it's the way that we look after victims, even the, the way the offenders are treated. Uh, everyone involved has skin in the game and there's, uh, there's a human element to it. And if we try to take that human element away, that's where we miss, uh, miss the importance of it. Well, hopefully the graduates out of Newcastle will have that sense of humanity and understanding of the nuances. You know, the world is not black and white yeah. and they have an opportunity to make a difference. And if they do that, then I've done my job properly. Well, I think they've got a pretty good uh, lecturer um, <laughs> trying to point them in the right direction. I've learnt a lot. Um, sitting here today. Um, I found the talk fascinating. Thank you so much for uh, coming on to uh, I Catch Killers. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, we, I'm sure there's a lot we can talk about. And I know you mentioned something that you're looking into. I don't even know if I want to mention that. <laughs> the, oh, oh, no, don't mention yeah, that. I don't know how, oh. where we go there, but th that is a bizarre world. That's a beer drink. That, yeah, <laughs> that's a beer that's, conversation. That is a bizarre world in which you, uh, you're working. So, but look, Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it and uh, good luck with your future. And I agree with you calling the uh, justice system into account from both sides. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers. This podcast series is brought to you by True Crime Australia. Visit iCatchKillers.com.au for additional material such as articles on what you heard, videos and galleries. You can search for the iCatch Killers with Gary Jubelin official group on Facebook and join in with discussion. See you for the next episode of the podcast. <laughs>